Um, I'm happy to answer anything. And uh, this is really just um, a presentation on something that I think is like really neat, very cool. Um, and I'm just trying to kind of motivate the idea of types. <clears throat> and so we'll get started off with an obligatory Wikipedia quote. Uh, Type system associates a type with each computed value, and by examining the flow of these values, attempts to ensure or prove that no type errors can, uh, can occur. Uh, what that means is that when you write a program, you typically have a bunch of variables, uh, arguments, functions, et cetera. You have a bunch of values. That's what we call value. Um, and we attempt to associate a type with that value. So for instance, a 1 is an integer. Um, a uh, hello world is a string, et cetera. So those are types, uh, very basic types, but they're types nonetheless. Um, and the idea behind a type system is that we can give everything a type and um, reason about our program in some way. I actually added this slide this morning because there's a, there's a book that's coming out apparently called Type Driven Development with Idris. I found out that it existed this morning and uh, read through the preface and this was in there. I fit. So there are three kind of interpretations of what a type does for you. Um, for a machine, it describes how bits in memory um, are to be interpreted by the machine. Um, so for instance, an integer needs to be interpreted by the machine differently than uh, string would. Um, for a compiler, it helps to ensure that bit patterns are interpreted consistently. Um, so when you see two separate strings, they're, you want to make sure that they're interpreted in the same sort of way. Um, and for a programmer, the types help you to name and organize concepts. And that's sort of the main focus of this talk is just um, types help the programmer write code that means what you want it to mean. And so what I'm going to start out with here is just a bunch of different function signatures. Are you guys familiar? Is everybody familiar with what a, what a function signature is, like a type signature, a method header? So well, OK, I'm going to switch to the next slide. And let me know if it's something that you completely do not recognize. Because maybe my terminology is weird. Does this make sense? We don't have a body to this function or anything, but basically what you're saying is you're declaring a function that takes two arguments. The, the names are list A and list B. Um, this is JavaScript. <laughs> That's a type signature. That's a type signature. Yeah. Well, it's sort of. A function signature. Yeah, so there's no. There's two a lot of times it'll say what it returns as well. Yeah, and we'll get to that. Um, next one, next language I want to look at is Python. So this is a different function that does somewhat the same thing in Python. Um, this declares a function named add that takes an argument named a and an argument named b. And I haven't written the the, the body here. Uh, had to rag on Java a little bit because I feel like the uh, <laughs> the 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 method signatures get a little bit out of hand. Um, but this is Java, and this is actually the first instance of a type signature that we've seen. So this one actually annotates its arguments with a type and a return value. Um, but it's really confusing, kind of, to, to sort of figure out where in this mess you're actually defining anything. So uh, the function name is max. And it takes an argument named the list. And there are annotations about the types of this thing, and we'll visit that later. Uh, the next language I want to look at is Haskell. Uh, this, is, this is sort of where I expect questions to come in, so feel free to ask. Um, but basically, the, the function signatures look a little bit different in, in Haskell and Haskell-inspired languages. But essentially, this is declaring a function called print that takes uh, an argument named a and produces a 
um, an IO action that returns nothing. So um, this can just be read as like, these are constraints, we don't need to look at this right now. Um, but uh, basically, this is a, an argument to the function and this is the return value. Does that make sense? Pascal's actually number nine on GitHub right now. Hey, Eduardo. <laughs> Um, next language I want to look at is Elm. This is Elm. Um, the syntax is very inspired by Haskell, and so is the next language that we're going to look at. But um, this is a type signature in Elm. Uh, same sort of thing. You have an argument right here. This is an argument, and it uh, produces a string. We're going to look at all these things in more depth later, so I'm not going to explain exactly what they mean entirely right now. Are you jumping between a type signature and a function signature? Or so there, the same thing. there's a, the thing is, um, so in Java, Python, and JavaScript, the function header that you saw is actually a part of the function in, in a way. So like here, you're saying uh, you're defining a function add that takes arguments named A and B. There's no types in the language. So. But there's no types. There's no type annotations. But in Java, for instance, like, you have these type annotations that are kind of mixed in. Um, in Haskell, Elm, and the next one that we're looking at, the type signature actually sits above the definition of the function. So you're not actually naming the arguments, but you're naming um, just type variables. <laughs> so it would be kind of akin to taking, like ripping out the, uh, the annotations here and like moving them up a line, kind of. If that makes sense. Like, you're not mixing the, the type definitions with the, the actual function. Um, we'll look at it later so that it, it'll probably make more sense when there is a function body, and we'll look at that in a minute. Um, so that's Elm. Uh, this is particularly interesting for some reason. Um, and so is this. Uh, this is Idris. Uh, if you go back to the other slide, this is the, the book that was being written about. Um, that I discovered this morning. Uh, but uh, this one's different in that it takes two arguments and produces uh, another argument. Again, don't worry too much about it, but I want to make sure that everybody understands that um, these first two, the first two uh, things separated by arrows here are arguments, and the last one is always the return value. So. Um, that's how you kind of read a, a Haskell-like function and signature. Does that make sense? So here we're saying we have two arguments that produce this arguments. It doesn't have a variable number of arguments. So that there's support for that kind of thing? There's some trickery, but, but yeah. Um, I can explain why that is. That's OK. Um, I'll explain it. I'll explain it to you later, Brandon. <laughs> uh, this is another function signature in Haskell. Empty. <laughs> Left empty for a reason. Um, we'll go into it later. <laughs> well, what, what, well, what are we talking about? Um, I expect that everybody's a little bit confused, and that's semi-intended, because I kind of want to dig into what all of these things mean, um, what they give us, and uh, just kind of rip apart the function signatures and figure out what they are. That's kind of what I want to do in this talk. Uh, so the first thing I want to talk about is uh, strong typing versus weak typing. Um, <clears throat> so with our definition of add in Python, Python is actually strongly typed. And what this means is that um, you, you can't take a type like string and a type like int and add them together, you have to, instead, you have to actually explicitly change the string into an integer before adding them. So you get a little bit of, um, you get a little bit of type safety here, where if you call add on one and then the string two, it's going gonna, it's gonna to yell at you, because you're trying to add an integer and a string together. Um, and that's all it means. That's what strongly typed means. Um, there's no implicit type coercion, is what we call it. Does that make sense? 
JavaScript, on the other hand, is weakly typed. Um, so concat, I said list A and list B. This would actually work on lists and integers and strings all the same, because plus works on all those things. Um, in particular, it works on integers and strings. And when you add an integer to a string, it actually coerces the integer into a string and then appends it. So concat the number one with the string two gives you the <coughs> string one, two. Um, Wouldn't it be uh, the same to say coerce is the same as cast? Yes, it's the same. So there's synonymous. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I would argue that this is bad because uh, the you uh, the compiler is doing it's making an arbitrary choice here. Um, it could just as well have casted the two the string two into an integer and added them. Um, but you actually somewhere in your mind you have to understand that this kind of thing can happen if your if your types don't match. Um, and you have to know how the JavaScript is actually implemented, um, which can be confusing. So I prefer the Python style, but that's not everybody's opinion. And I'm not trying to like, I, I, yeah, I should say this. Um, I'm not trying to force my opinions on anybody. I just want to uh, educate, I guess. So static versus dynamic typing. For some reason, I thought that was like really clever. I was I was wondering because you have like this static rock and it's dynamically <laughs> running over Squidward. So, <laughs> um, static typing. Um, Java is statically typed. So, let's go over what this actually means. There's actually a blog post in. Uh, there's a blog post about exactly what this means, which was on the, the slide that initially exposed this. Um, but essentially what it means is that Max takes a list of things that extend. Basically, it means that uh, Max takes a list of things and it, it can, that can be compared to anything it extends. That's the maximum of them. Um, I haven't provided the implementation because honestly, I don't know the implementation. Not right, Java for a living. Um, but that's what that's what the type signature means. And so, if you try to call something on, if you if you try to call max on something that's not comparable with its like uh, its parents and and everything that it extends, then this actually won't compile. Um, so if somewhere in your code base you have like max one and a, a list of integers, it's not gonna it's not gonna work out uh, because one of these constraints is broken. Does that make sense? This is kind of confusing even to me. So, but uh, I just want to get the uh, the idea. Um, and so then we have dynamic typing. Uh, dynamic typing, it, it doesn't, it, it means that you can kind of call, you don't have to explicitly give the, the types of your program. Like it, it doesn't care about the types until you actually call a function that um, acts on those types and fails. So at runtime, if add gets called with two types that don't match, it will fail. But for instance, it, in this example, like Python will run this code because it gets if false and then it just skips this branch. So it never actually checks this. So at runtime, this never gets hit. So Python doesn't care. Static typing checks everything beforehand when it compiles. Dynamic typing checks everything at runtime. Um, and so to do never run it, it happily, it happily will run. This program won't do anything, but it has a it has a type error. It 
just never gets run. If you were to remove this, it would fail. Mm -hmm. So what's the difference between, maybe this is synonymous with uh, scripting languages versus compiled languages? I mean, yeah, yeah. somewhat. Although PHP 7 has some work. Right? No. It's, it's still dynamically typed. Okay. I believe that it has, it has a strict mode. Does that does that mean that it will run the type checking before before it runs? Before it runs. Uh no, you need like a type checker. Yeah. So I think PHP is still dynamically typed. I, I think this kind of thing will still work. Uh, what if you have like Maybe you're going to get into this. What if you're dealing with like user input and like they're just not putting in the right types of use for like validating on the JavaScript side? You val I mean, you val validate validating. input. Yeah. You, you don't want to just. So, first off, if one thing that static typing does give you is so if a user inputs something that's complete crap, right. um, the type checker might fail. Like the if you call a function with those arguments and it and they don't work, then it might fail. Um, but typically, you know, the user input you want to take it, clean it, and uh, don't you don't want to just apply it to to functions anyway directly. <clears throat> like in this case, so if you took user input from somebody on a console and they put in like add one and a, right? right. You don't want that to work. Sure. Um, so that's kind of motivation behind that. Uh, next thing I want to talk about is polymorphism. Big word. Uh, is everybody familiar with polymorphism? OK, cool. Nobody is familiar with polymorphism. Cool. I get this. Now that we know of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's simple. Um, first thing I want to talk about is actually the Haskell code that I wrote. Um, Parametric polymorphism basically means that you can have a function that works on multiple types. Um, so for instance, the print function, it doesn't really care what you give it as long as it can be printed to the console. That's what it does. So it prints a value to the console. Um, so A here is a, what we call a, a polymorphic type variable. It's just a fancy way of saying it can be any type you you want. Um, and then we have this thing before the double arrow uh, is just it's a constraint that says that that a that you give it that type has to be convertible to a string safely. So uh, given an integer, there's an obvious way to convert it to a string and print it. Um, all this is saying is that. If you give me something like a function that I don't know how to print, it, it, it won't type check. You can't, you can't call this function on that. And so that's called parametric polymorphism with constraints. This might be simpler if I give you a different example. So the sort of canonical example for this is the length of a list. Um, so in Haskell, a list has to have the same type of elements. You can't have like a list of integers, strings, and, and whatever. It has to be a list of integers, for instance. Um, but the length function doesn't care what's in the list. It just cares that there's an element there. So the length function takes a list of a's and produces an integer, which is just the length of the list. But it doesn't care what the type is. So that's kind of a, a, it's a global type variable that can be anything. Does that make sense? Sort of. Any question? Why is Haskell so hard to read? It's not hard to read. <laughs> All right, so how would I even enter a, a equal greater than in, in my keyboard? Like, is that a real? Oh, sorry. That actually Keynote Keynote uh, did that. It's just equals and uh, angle bracket, and this is just a like a ASCII version of that, just a dash and a, an arrow. And you would actually type that in your code. Like yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. That's how it is. Sorry, yeah. Um, Haskell's not hard to read. I actually got Ben Larkin's uh, 
I, I, I told him about something and he uh, really liked the way that this reads now. He was really confused about it to begin with, but it took him about a day to, to get to get used to it. That's what I was thinking, like it's it really just like this learning curve where you just gotta kinda of get over it and then you're fine. I mean, certainly I think that this is easier to read than Well yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like Yeah, I agree. I think that's a mess. Um, I mean, it, 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 it's simple, like, in, in, in its length, right? But it's just, like, all these things that are, just, are, are somewhat foreign, which is what makes it intimidating. Well, I know when, when you're in C, you can have the same function there that operates on an integer and a string, and one operates on, on a string and an integer. Those are two completely different functions. That's right? one. That's what you're talking about? Yeah, somewhat. Okay. So in C, I think what you're talking about is, um, like method overloading, it is polymorphism. It's not exactly the same. It's more akin to generics. Have you ever used generics in something? That, um, basically, what a generic is is so you can define like a, a, a list of things as a data structure, right? But in a language like Java or C, C sharp, whatever. Um, you can specify like the type of the thing that you want in the list. Yeah. So you can say um, you can con construct like a new list of ints, and they go in like these little brackets. Um, that's what this is essentially. It's just a, a function that operates on multiple different types. But Haskell also lets you give constraints to those types, so it doesn't work on everything. It just works on Things that are showing that makes sense. Yeah. Cool. Uh, the other thing, the other type of uh, polymorphism I want to talk about is subtype polymorphism. Um, Haskell does not support this. Um, and basically, what it means is if you have a parent class, so you have like a, um, I don't know, one of these, a, say you have like a, an, a, automobile type and then you have like a train and a car and they both extend the automobile type sure. um, basically what this does is it says subtype polymorphism lets you operate on all three of those types in the same way just by saying give me an automobile because car and train are both automobiles you can uh, they essentially are the same uh, as long as they have some functionality, as long as they extend that same class. Um, and so that's what this does in a sense. Um, you have, I'm not, yeah, I already talked about it. Um, basically, things need to be comparable to their parents. So that's a Java feature, not a Haskell feature? Or yes, uh, Haskell does not support subtyping. This is a really cool type of polymorphism that most people actually do not know about. Um, Elm is a statically and strongly typed language, uh, much like Haskell is. But one thing that is, it's kind of hard to do in Haskell is that you have to define a data type for everything, um, which is good in some ways, but bad in others. So when you're working with, with uh, things like JSON responses from an API. You might want to parse it into some structure, and then um, you might want to do something on one response that looks very much like something you want to do on another response, because the fields match up. So um, that's kind of a real world example, and I don't even know why I'm talking about it. But this is, um, this is an example of a function that is row polymorphic. And what that means is that show person takes a record, and this looks a lot like a, a JavaScript record, um, that has the fields first and last as strings. And it converts that into a string. But what you can do is it doesn't, it doesn't strictly say that these are the only things that your record can have. You can add on as many other things as you want. So as long as you have this information, 
the first and last name of a person, I guess, um, you can safely call this function and it'll type check. So for instance, you can call show person on the record, first Ben, last Kobach, age 20. Note, I have the, the extra field there. Um, it'll type check, it'll run, it'll spit out that string. Um, but if you omit the last, it'll give you a type error. So it gives you this uh, assurance that you at least have the fields that you care about when you're calling. Yeah. Can you run um, like I guess? Do you have a uh, type checks on the like uh, and stuff that's not like it's in the record sort of like a couple age like how you know that age is not correct Yeah, so the the thing that you pass in is actually, this is going to be typed as first string, last string, age. Yeah. And you can assert that that's true. Like, you can, um, you can, you can explicitly give this a type, or it'll be inferred. Um, but as far as show person is concerned, it doesn't care. Like, it doesn't give a crap about the rest of the stuff, as long as you have the first and last uh, fields. So the next thing I want to talk about is type inference. <laughs> uh, so we saw the Haskell code before with the type signature that everybody was asking about. Um, what's neat about Haskell and other languages that support type inference is that um, you don't actually have to write it. You don't have to write that type signature. You can write this, print A equals put sterling show A, uh, which means convert the, convert the value to a string and then print it on its own line. Um, and Haskell will actually gladly infer the type of this thing for you. It's not saying that it's not typed. It is typed, but the compiler will figure out the type of it for you. So if you call this on something that you can't show, that, you, that can't be printed, it will still fail. Uh, the, the type signature that I showed you before actually is the inferred type of this value. Um, I think this is really powerful um, because it, it lets you kind of like write what you want to write and then figure out what it is that the type actually says about so it. So it, it, it figures out what type you want it to be based on the function that you're calling on it? So like right yeah. now you're doing like a uh, thing that operates on the string, so it's saying make sure that this is it's gonna it's gonna infer that you want this to be a string. Yep. So here, this is a sort of a more long example. Um, so what the compiler will do is it sees that the type of show is as follows. Um, so show takes an A that can be shown and turns it into a string. So it knows that the type of this is this thing. Uh, it, it, it means that show A is a string. Um, and puts, puts Sterling takes a string and turns it into this, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and so when you call this on the result of this, it knows that it's producing this value, this type of a value. Um, and from all of that, it can go back and infer the type of the actual thing. It knows that a. So what are you actually writing here, like in your code? The like you're not writing all of that. Like no, this is all inferred. You can so omit just the all first of this. line is. Yeah, this is just kind of writing and then first the rest. Right. So is show that I O? Is that what I O is that? Show takes a takes a value and turns it into a string. Okay. And put the string line, takes a string, and prints it. So what this does is it takes something that can be converted to a string, converts it to a string, and then prints it. Oh, um, OK, I see. So OK, you're defining OK, I see. Yeah. Cool. Is that syntax clear, sort of? I got it. OK, cool. And I'm the least programmer here, so. All right. Um, next thing I'm going to talk about is nuts. Uh, this is not 
supported in very many languages yet, but it's kind of the next big thing in uh, programming languages. Um, uh, and these are dependent types. So I talked about how in like the second slide in the Wikipedia quote, you have a type and you have a value and you want to associate a type to a value. Um, so when we see one, we want to know that it's an int, et cetera. What dependent type sort of does, but a dependent type system kind of meshes them together a little bit. So you get, you get uh, these assurances about your values from types, which is really crazy. Um, it kind of blows my mind. Um, this is sort of the canonical example. It's like the first one that you'll find if you look at the dependent types online. Um, and what this function says is, actually, I'm going to skip to the next slide because it has a nice little diagram. Um, this function says we have two lists that produce another list. Um, like I said before, we have, you can kind of ignore this n, m, and n plus m for now. Um, and so we just have a list of a's, a list of, another list of a's, and we want to produce another list of a's. So what this does is it merges two lists together. That make sense? Just ignoring the n, m, and the n plus m. That's what we have. We have a function that takes two lists with things that are typed the same and produces a new list with things that are typed the same. Um, what dependent types does is it lets you specify the length of the list in the type. So you can say, I have a list with n a's, I have a list with m a's, and I want a list with a's. And the type checker actually can figure this out for you. That, that your implementation of your function preserves the length of the list. So if you accidentally mess something up, it'll yell at you. If you leave off uh, an element, like if you have an off by one error or something, it'll, it won't type check, it won't compile. And so I think that's kind of crazy. Um, so here's an example of a, an implementation that does not type check. Um, concat nil lies equals lies, that just means that if we have an empty list, that's what nil is. Um, if we have an empty list and y's, some list, then concatting them together is just exactly that list. Um, and then here, if we have a, the head of a list and the rest of it and another list, then we just take the head of the list and put it onto the concatenation of the rest of the list with the, with the other list. It might be a little bit confusing, but essentially what it's doing is just taking each element of the first list and tacking it onto the element, uh, tacking it onto the second one, one by one. And um, actually, this do doesn't type check because the length of x's isn't the same as the length of y's in all cases. So the type checker will complain that list n plus n a is not the same as list n plus m a because y's had that length m, list has that length n. When you're concatenating um, x's and x's together, you're getting a list of length n plus n, or 2n. Um, and so that implementation does not take check. Um, does that make sense? It gives you some like crazy assurances about things. This is a technique that proof checkers use. Uh, and like, basically, it assures that your function is almost like a unit test. Yeah, it's literally like an assurance that your thing is correct. That's why type systems are cool because if you have a strong type system, then your type can say a lot about your implementation of the function. Um, and this is one instance where it says. I think everything. I don't. I don't know. Well, I guess there. I don't think that there's a way to generically. Um, uh, I don't think. I don't think there's any way to make this type check except for the correct implementation, other than maybe putting the elements in in a weird way. 
So yeah, it is almost like a unit test. Types do give you a lot of insurances. Um, thing I want to talk about is effect typing. I think this is telling. So this guy is uh, picking up some dirt, putting it in his uh, in his truck, and then suddenly gets pummeled by some avalanche of stuff. And I like to to liken this to changing a piece of code and then having your entire program crash for God knows why. I'm sure everybody is familiar with that. <laughs> um, this is one of the things that Haskell supports. Um, it's what we call effect typing. Um, before I kind of skimmed over like what this meant, but basically what this says is that um, the IO type is just a you can think of it as kind of an annotation that your function is doing I.O. Um, and so in Haskell, we strive to rip out all of the, the pure, I don't, I don't know, like you guys have probably heard that term before, the pure parts of the program, um, and separate them from these functions that have this, this action I.O. type, the, the effect type. Um, this is just one of many effects, um, but essentially, what you're doing is you can't you can't write a you can't write an implementation of this function that produces not an IO action, but perhaps more importantly, you can't you can't provide so if this was if this didn't have this IO annotation and you tried to do the same thing then it wouldn't compile. It, it wouldn't let you do it, because print performs IO. Um, and with type inference and all this stuff, you can kind of write things how you want to write them. And then when you run into a problem where maybe one of your functions is doing unnecessary IO, it's messing with the database somewhere, messing with some global state, you can, uh, it won't work. And, and it, it really encourages you to separate out the, the parts of your program that don't do these giant mutations and side effects is what we, we call them, um, that can mess up other parts of your program. So that's effect typing. Um, so I have, one of the things I would think would be useful with that would be like, OK, I want to add two numbers together. That's going to force you to do the, the adding within your code rather than going to an external source, like a database, to do that. Is that sort of the intent? Like if, yeah. If, if, if your function is supposed to compute a hash or something, or whatever it is supposed to do, it forces you to do that within your code rather than having some site exactly. outside yeah. of your code. Yeah, so in that instance, so say you want to like grab two numbers from a user and then add them, right? And then print them out. Uh, you, you would first write a function that gets those two values from the user in whatever way. And then you can write a pure function that just takes two integers and produces a new integer. Um, and you can provide those. Uh, those values that you got from the user to that function, compute it on its own, again, its own pure function, and then use the result of that function to print it back out. Um, so that way, all of the logic, all of like the, the code logic is contained in a, a pure function that doesn't do any side effect. Yeah, that's the, that's the goal. This is a, an annotation of kind of what this means. Um, I know this is really confusing, so I wanted to at least write down kind of what this means. It, the show, show is just essentially an interface that A has to implement to be used by print. So show has a function called show that, that turns a value into a, it turns a value into a string. Um, it's kind of akin to implementing like two string in PHP or Java or whatever. Um, basically it says if you have that, then you can call this function um, that takes a value, produces an IO action that returns this like little oval thing, just open and close is, you can think of it as the, the empty tuple. So like in a database it would be like selecting nothing. Um, essentially it has one value, which is that and it's kind of the equivalent in Haskell to void in 
PHP or Java or wherever. So it's a function that returns an IO action that doesn't that doesn't give you back any value. Because when you print, you, you don't expect anything to come back. It's just printing out the value for returns. Nothing. Um, IO is just one of many effects as well. Um, but so here's, for instance, this is an example of a, of a program that won't compile. Uh, this is using some syntactic sugar in the form of do notation to, to do this. But basically what it says is you have a function called add a, b, and you want to print that a out, and then return the addition of those two numbers together. This actually won't compile because it's not annotated with IO. Um, because you're doing some printing in there, it's not going to let you. It's not going to let you annotate that function as something that takes two integers and produces another one, because it does something else. Um, yeah, fact typing school. Y'all are interested. Uh, I do have an extra segment that is sort of a departure from from this. Um, this kind of. Uh, Examining the examining function signatures. All right, <laughs> cool. Uh, is everybody familiar with what a binary tree is? Okay. So um, Haskell doesn't support subtyping, like I said before, but what it does support is this thing called algebraic data types, which can kind of encode a lot of those situations where you might want subtyping but don't have it. Um, and this is kind of, this was one of the coolest instances of algebraic data types being used that I noticed when I first started learning Haskell was uh, an implementation of a binary tree. Um, so in a binary tree, you can have one of three different things. You can either have uh, an empty binary tree with nothing in it. You can have a leaf that has a value attached to it. And this value can be any type. It could be of any type. Um, or you can have what, what you might consider to be like an actual binary tree. You have a binary tree that has a value at its, at its root. And to the left of it, you have another tree, another binary tree. And to the right of it, you have another binary tree. All these things are typed the same. Uh, so algebraic data types are cool. Uh, they let you specify these uh, separate, like, it's called like a union of types. But basically what it is, it's saying that empty is a binary tree. Leaf with a, with a value, a leaf with a value is a binary tree, it's valid. And a, an actual binary tree with a, a value. and Two trees going off to the left or right is also a binary tree. Is, um, is MP like a type? Yeah. But, well, uh, so. Yeah, that's the thing I was wondering. Is that just like um, just names that you give it to each one of them? Yeah, it's just names that you give it. Okay. So MD has type tree A. Good. Um, and this is an example of what it would look like to encode. This binary tree in Haskell. Um, basically, at the top we have a value of five. So we start out with a binary tree. Um, down here we have actual value of the binary tree. To the right we have that leaf with a value of eight. Um, and to the left we have another binary tree with a value with a root with a value of three. And to the left. There's a, a leaf with a value of two, and to the right there's just an empty node. Um, and obviously, you can kind of construct these computationally just by you know, putting, adding things and removing things from binary tree as you see fit. Um, but all of these things, like it, it, it turns out to be typed as like a tree integer. Um, because this is a tree that contains integers. If I were to change this to like value equals 
hello or something, it wouldn't type check because it's not it doesn't contain the uh, it doesn't type it. It's not a tree with the type integer. But yeah, I think it's pretty cool. Um, it's a different way of looking at subtyping in a way um, because each like empty leaf and bin tree are all valid binary trees. Um, you can do things like um, instead of having a whole bunch of exceptions that are derived from like a base exception class, etc. You can actually just list out the, the cases in a single type, name it exception, and uh, uh, it has a bunch of different um, cases of values that it can be. Would it that mean that you have to put all your exceptions in the same file? Right, like, uh, yeah. But it, that's kind of, well, no. Uh, there's a couple of different things you can do. So you can. Let me go back one. Uh, so, for instance, if you had, if you had like a specific class of exceptions, then you could have, um, say, you could have like a base exception class or base exception type, and one of the, the cases could be like a tag, and then it could contain one of the, the sub exception types. So instead of, for instance, like, um, hard to do without like code. Yeah. Um, but basically, you have like an exception, like type exception equals like base exception, whatever. And then like underneath it, you might have like uh, HTTP exception. And then you could give that, give that branch, like we do like here, like value. Yeah. You could give that an actual like concrete type of the sub exception type. Okay. I was mainly just wondering how would it even, like, be extensible or if it's extensible at all. Like, yeah. Like, it all being locked down to one file. Sure. It is extensible in that way. Um, a lot of Haskell code tends to sort of, I mean, at least in the projects I've worked on, like, the types, you kind of want to keep them all together. So if you have a whole bunch of different types of exceptions, um, you might also separate the exceptions into different like so if you have like a, an HTTP action, it might throw an HTTP exception, but it but it doesn't necessarily throw anything else. So you might have this different class of HTTP exceptions, um, and it can throw one of those, but maybe it can't throw every exception. So you just specify that the function can throw one of those type of exceptions, uh, not all of them. Um, but yeah, a little hard to do without, without code. Hard to explain. But, but yeah, you can do it. Anyway, thank you. <laughs> types, but really it was Haskell in disguise. <laughs> <laughs> It's the easiest way to talk about types to me. I mean, what? It's like a thing for a Yeah. Like a whole thing.